I love plane rides. You know, stick me in a metal tin at 35,000 feet with three weeks worth of the Sunday New York Times, and I am in absolute heaven. I turn my cell phone off, I call it forced relaxation, and I am home. I even bring snacks. So there I am on a plane from London to Vancouver, and a woman sits down next to me, and uh, she's a talker. Where am I from? Was I in London for business or pleasure? How was my trip? What do I do for a living? And I pause, and the voice in my head takes over. Do I tell her? You see, I'm an obesity physician. I am a doctor who treats those people. And sometimes I lie about the work that I do, and that really sucks, because not only am I incredibly proud of my job, I am absolutely in love with the work that I do. I am proud that the science has finally caught up in obesity medicine. I'm proud that we now know that obesity is a disease, that we know of its complex physiology, of its genetics, and that it's not just simply a lack of willpower on behalf of the patient. I'm proud that we know that obesity is a function of the fact that the brain thinks it's starving and not the fault of the person carrying this disease. And I'm proud that we now have legitimate evidence-based treatments that can banish the brainwashing of the dieting industry that tells patients that they just need to exert a little bit more self-control and work harder and shut their mouths. And I love that I have created this amazing clinical space where we can focus on health at every size, where we can champion the health potentials of every patient, and where we treat everyone with compassion and with empathy. Sure, in a forum like this one, I am bold about what I do. I am a shouted from the rooftops kind of person. But in certain situations, depending on my mood or uh, the day that I've had, I'm a little less forthcoming about my life's work. Let me explain. The flight from London to Vancouver is 10 and a half hours. Do I really want to hear the advice of the woman sitting next to me about how, oh, those people really should just work a little bit harder, how we have a toxic environment, how sugar is the devil, and really, why don't I just recommend keto? It worked beautiful for her brother. And I think about decades of being an obesity physician to a population of people who have been told that they are less than just because they weigh more. And I think about the bias that my patients face every single day of their lives and how they couldn't simply avoid a conversation like this one because they literally wear their disease. I even look around the plane. Maybe there is a person on this plane with obesity who had to summon courage and conviction and ask for a seatbelt extender or stare down the person sitting next to them just because they were taking up a little bit more space in the seat. I think about all of that. I channel my social and my ethical North Star and I check myself. Is this the moment? Is this the moment where I stare it all down and I go with what's right and not with what's convenient? What do I do for a living? I'm an art dealer. <laughs> Obesity is as much a disease as depression or asthma or Parkinson's. And telling people who carry extra weight to simply eat less and move more is like telling people with depression to cheer up it's like asking someone with asthma to take deep breaths or telling someone with Parkinson's to just hold still. And make no mistake, we did that years ago. But the science caught up, and when we know better, we do better. And we stop blaming patients. Why is it that a woman with breast cancer is a fighter, but a woman with obesity is a failure? And how is it that despite volumes of science showing the complexity of this disease and its causes, that we still blame patients? Well, it's simple. It's bias. And I think about the places where bias in medicine came before and the times, so many times, where we got it wrong. 
1974, homosexuality was finally declassified as a psychiatric illness where it had been classified in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual for decades before. In 1932, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment began where 400 men with syphilis, poor African-American sharecroppers from Macon, Georgia, were recruited by the United States Public Health Service. They were denied absolute curative treatment at the time and instead given placebos in the way of vitamins and aspirin while the doctors watched what happens when you don't treat syphilis. The study went on for 40 years and was finally shut down, but not before killing half the men and not before 40 of them had transmitted the disease to their wives. And a study as recently as this year, 2019, showed that women who present with symptoms of a heart attack are 20% less likely to receive the same standard of care for a heart attack as men. Bias against sexual orientation, bias against race, and bias against gender. We shouldn't be surprised because these biases exist well beyond the clinical bedside and they permeate into our everyday lives. They affect how we love and how we teach and how we talk and they influence who we elect and the laws that we make and the way that we govern. They flourish at our tables and on our Twitter accounts and in our playgrounds and in our boardrooms. 63% of children with obesity have been bullied at school because of their weight. 54% of people at work with obesity have been bullied because of their weight. And 64% of patients have had inappropriate comments issued to them by their physicians because of their weight. Fat people are stupid. They are inappropriate. They are uh, uninformed, they are lazy and weak, and treating them is an absolute waste of time. They got themselves into this mess and they better get themselves out. And we push and we marginalize and we tell people that this is on them. 69% of doctors surveyed have weight bias. 72% of medical students have weight bias. 55% of nurses, 43% of dietitians, and the list goes on. We judge people as less than because they weigh more. Well, why should you care? Never mind the fact that this is morally wrong and that it's cruel and the world has seen enough cruelty to last us lifetimes. As a doctor, I take particular offense to this because it's bad medicine. Weight bias worsens the care that we provide. Studies show that patients with obesity are examined less often by a ratio of two to one, that simple procedures are explained to them less often, that they are treated less, they are offered less treatment, they are diagnosed less. In other words, our weight bias influences the quality of the care that we provide. Weight bias makes people sicker. Studies show that patients with obesity exposed to weight bias have higher rates of inflammation in their blood, have higher rates of depression, of high blood pressure, that they have literally a clinical worsening. And furthermore, they are less likely to engage in treatment because that treatment is seen as pointless. And finally, weight bias kills people. Volumes of studies show that patients with obesity exposed to weight bias die sooner and die more frequently. It makes perfect sense. If we don't examine patients as often, if we don't offer them treatment, and if we don't effectively diagnose and treat them, well then, indeed, they'll die sooner. Why should you care? Well, sure, as a doctor, it offends me. In fact, it pisses me off. And some of you might be healthcare providers. Some of you may know people in the healthcare system. Sure, be offended for them. But more importantly, all of you are patients. And at some point in your lives, you're going to come to this system. And what's it going to be like 
when biases like this exist? What other ones might be out there that actually affect you personally? But bigger than that, we know that bias is influenced by the worlds that we live in, that medicine reflects culture and culture reflects medicine. And so this speaks to a bigger narrative within our world. And I want us as citizens of that world to take four small steps to conquer bias in our everyday lives and then eventually, of course, in the institutions that we belong to. Step number one, check yourself. Do you have weight bias? Well, studies show that 80% of you do. It's okay, we all have it. In fact, there's a volume of evidence to show that bias is born out of a fault in evolutionary biology. You see, thousands of years ago, we needed a way, for example, for our brains, our primitive brains, to be able to distinguish between what was safe and what was not safe. And our bias is born by a miscommunication of the worlds that we live in influencing that circuitry to tell us what is wrong and what is not wrong. And when it comes to weight, all we've heard is that it's weakness and that it's wrong. And so our brains couldn't help to be wired in the wrong way. But now that you know that obesity is a disease, and now that you know that it's caused by a fault of anywhere between 5,000 genes and 37 different hormones and a number of 600 food cues inappropriately firing in a day. And now that you know that it's not a will issue, but it's a physiology issue, you can start to correct the narratives in your own brain and rewire that primitive experience. And once we have science, we know better and we do better. Step two, language matters. You know, fat jokes, fat comments, inappropriate dieting advice at the grocery store. Fat shaming is the last socially acceptable prejudice that we have. It's wrong, it's cruel, and quite frankly, it's beneath us. And so I challenge all of you to have conversations well beyond today, but to watch your mouth. Watch the words that you use. And in short, instead of worrying what comes out, what goes into other people's mouths, rather, let's watch what comes out of our own. Step three, positive imagery. Well, we have been so bombarded by the negative and the doom and the gloom that is involved in obesity. And studies show that 72% of all media images portray obesity in a negative light. And we already know that bias is born by our primitive brains receiving the wrong kind of pictures. Why is it that there are so many negative, headless men and women with obesity in beige? Let's give our brains something different to look at. Where are all the bright, beautiful, magical experiences that show me that this is magic? You know, I think of my patients and they are indeed the perfect picture of strength and resilience and intelligence and style and grace. If we exposed ourselves more to images like these, we might actually change the way our brains see the world. And we might realize that this isn't just perfectly acceptable, it's perfect. And finally, let's all have some shared experiences and evoke empathy. What if our heroes were people with size? And what if they were heroes because of what they did? and not because of the weight they lost. You know, when we sit with people and we hear their stories, we can't possibly be cruel. We see past the tissue and the trite, and we speak to what is human in us all. My patients remind me every single day that everyone has a story, and that every story has value. 
And when we listen to people and we hear their stories, we put the puzzles together and we realize that all of us have value and that we need to see the world differently in terms of heroes of size, that people should be celebrated because of their disease and not in spite of it. So there you have it. Check your mind, watch your mouth, positive imagery, evoke empathy. You know, as a doctor and a lifelong learner, I want to be better every day. I want us all to be better. And I know there's a way for us to do that and for us to look at our biases and fix what is wrong. And I know there's a way that when we do that, we'll start to heal a broken world. Mind, mouth, eyes, heart. Well, because my profession demands it because my patients deserve it, and because we could all use a little bit of healing in this world of ours. And if for no other reason, I really love flying to and from London, and the next time I'm sitting on a plane and someone sits down next to me and asks, what do you do for a living? Well, I can smile and simply say, I'm an obesity doctor. Thank you. Thank you.